You're listening to the Self Made is a Myth, Make a Difference Together show with your host, Coach Tim Campsall, where we talk with successful business owners to hear the stories of their journeys in building their successful businesses. And more importantly, we recognize the folks who help them excel because we know that achieving business success is not something we can do on our own. Hello, everyone. This is Coach Tim Campbell, and I'm excited to have a fellow business owner from Indiana with us today. My guest has never had formal landscape design or industry schooling, yet has a successful business. In his downtime, he enjoys spending that with his family and friends, and he's most proud of the values that his parents instilled in him, like integrity, honesty, and respect. It is a pleasure to welcome Lowell to the show today. Hello, Lowell. How are you? Good morning, Tim. I'm great. How about yourself? I am awesome. Thanks for asking. Well, hey, let's start with having you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit of your personal story, like where you were born and live, about your family and and any hobbies that you have. Sure, sure. sure. My name is Lowell Rolski. I um, am the sole owner of a company called ProCare Horticultural Services. It's been around since 1972. Uh, my, biz- my father started this business when I was uh, in uh, high school. So I've always had a uh, hand in helping out whenever it was necessary. Uh, spent most of my spring breaks and summers and and even through college um, helping my dad whenever it was necessary, which was pretty much all the time. <laughs> so um, as far as hobbies and things like that, I don't have a lot of hobbies. I'm not good at most hobbies. So <laughs> it's, uh, it, it's one of those things that I... Um, if I'm not good at it, I try and tend, have a tendency to stay away from it. So. Yeah. Uh, how about uh, where you were born? Where do you live? And about your family? Sure. So my, uh, I was originally born in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, my father used to be superintendent of parks and recreation for um, Kansas City, um, uh, and um, took a job offer from then Mayor Richard Luger to help. Um, renovate the Indianapolis Parks Department. And um, it was his goal to try and step away from uh, the political side of things and and do things more without that kind of problems. And while Mayor Richard Luger's intent was good, the it wasn't easy for him to do that. So my father stepped away and started ProCare in 1972. So um, um, I went to school, um, was, had a plan to become a dentist and, um, specialized in maxillary surgery or orthodonture. And one thing led to another. I graduated from college, was going to go to dental school and then began, be, became more aware of those issues that come with specialization, which basically means you have to finish in the top 2% of your class. And being a realist, I uh, kind of felt that 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 opportunity wasn't as great as I would want it to be, uh, and I didn't necessarily want to go on and become just a dentist. So, um, and if I even if I did finish in the top two percent of my class, I had four years of of dental school and then four more years of specialization. So I was pretty sick of school at that point. <laughs> Life went on. <laughs> Very cool. And uh, where do you live now? So I live in Indianapolis now, uh, actually in Carmel, Indiana. Uh, and um, uh, I have uh, three grown children who all have gotten married in the last five and a half months. I actually have another wedding coming up. My last child's getting married uh, this weekend. So wow, I'll be, I'll be <laughs> off to that one um, here tomorrow. So um, it's been a it's been a, a ride <laughs> for sure. Well, hey, well, is there a funny story that your family likes to tell about you that you'd be willing to share with us today? So um, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the reality of it is is that um, 
we are a very tight and sarcastic family and we just like to have fun with each other and at everyone's expense <laughs> so um you know it's just it, it's 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 just a great opportunity to, to enjoy your children and and learn more about them as people and um just appreciate the kind of kids that they've become yeah fantastic so you told us a little bit about how um, the business came about, but how did uh, how did you um, come about? Be, you know, being the owner, and at what point did you have confidence that you could run the business? So um, it was, uh, you know, it was a family business, and um, um, I was always working with my father along with my younger brother, and um, it eventually evolved into the situation where. Uh, my brother left and I was forced into kind of running the company. My, my brother used to take care of, um, of, uh, of the actual running of the company. And I really enjoyed just landscape design and installation. And that's kind of where I focused my attention on. Um, and obviously if somebody else was going to take care of the business side of it, then I didn't have to worry about it. So, um, I was good with that. Um, but lives change, people's opinion of things change. And, and so I was kind of forced into doing the things that other people were doing. And, um, it was one step after the other, uh, until we got things, um, squared away. I've been, a, uh, always been a good delegator. I always had a God given gift to be able to draw, and I think sometimes the fact that I wasn't properly educated, if you if you really want to say that, um, sometimes makes me look at things in a different way where no, nobody told me what was right or wrong. Uh, <laughs> I did things because my customer wanted it or because I thought it was a good decision at the time. So um, that's kind of how I got to where I am. Um, I don't, uh, you know, I'm. I'm the kind of person that always considers it's important to make mistakes so that I can continue to learn. Otherwise, I'm just doing nothing, really. So <laughs> um, so we challenge ourselves every day to try and um, push what we, what we think we're capable of doing and to try and extend our expertise into our customers' backyard. Fantastic. Lowell, well, tell us uh, more about the company. Um, what's the name? What do you guys do? How do you help folks? So um, we're a total service landscape design build maintenance company. We also do uh, snow removal services as well as irrigation maintenance and monitoring services and renovation. Um, we, um, we have about uh, anywhere from 45 to 55 employees. Um, and that varies from year to year, obviously. Um, we do commercial maintenance as well as residential, high-end residential maintenance. And our landscape design build side is primarily high-end um, uh, residential landscapes. Um, uh, we have a very particular niche associated with meeting those kinds of needs and 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 taking care of customers who others might consider to be problematic or <laughs> troublesome or finicky or any of those like terms that you like to use. Um, and it, it actually, I think it makes us better. Fantastic. And what's the name again of the company? The name of the company is ProCare Horticultural Services. Fantastic. So for everyone listening, go check out the company in the link in the description and uh, Go visit Lau on uh, LinkedIn and watch. Tell him, let him know that you watched his interview. Hey, Lowell, share a story where someone pushed or inspired you that you could do it, even though maybe you didn't think that you could and the impact that that person had on you. So I think the person who had the most impact on me was my father, who, um, who always kind of looked at things and said, I don't know that people would pay for this but you don't know until you try. So um, I was always pushing that envelope and always uh, trying to 
um, gain a better understanding of how I could meet a customer's needs, whether that be a maintenance service or a landscape service, so that so that we could excel and exceed that expectation, however much was needed to require that uh, uh, that purpose. Mm. You know, for me, it was always harder to determine what customers saw as an exceeded expectation. Sometimes we like to look at things and say that our expectation might be up here when the customer's expectation really thought was down here and they just wanted us to be exceeded right? by this. Yes. <laughs> so we have all this room in between here where we're spending money and not making the kind of money that we could because we had our own idea of what was exceeded expectation when the customer's expectation could be somewhere in down here. Yes. So that, that took a lot, that took a lot for me to, to, to understand that and to, to, to determine that we were perhaps wasting time and energy and money when the customer never saw that difference. Mm -hmm. So yeah. understanding that becoming better educated about what that was needed and um, making sure that we weren't, uh, creating expectations that were outside the norm of what the customer might want. Yeah. It's that's, that's a critical point in terms of, you know, aligning up front, right. On what is the customer's expectation so that to your point, right. We don't put in time and energy and costs of doing something that is in their mind is kind of at a scope, right. Right. And I think it's a it's, sometimes it's a struggle for uh, salespeople, especially who don't who do everything in their power to try and meet the customer's expectations. And 90 percent of the time they're establishing an expectation that the customer had didn't even desire. Right. So you're telling the salesperson might be telling something, well, we'll get to it tomorrow. When in reality, the customer would have said, hey, I I'm fine. You know, I would have been fine if you would have got to it 10 days from now. Yes. <laughs> when the, the, customer, the, the salesperson should be asking is how soon were you thinking you wanted this done? Yes, Not, yes. <laughs> yeah. So um, it's a, it's all a learning curve and, and, and it's all experience and it's all um, feeling comfortable in that particular moment to be able to um, talk yeah. rationally and reasonably with a customer who sometimes can be or have an expectation that's crazy yeah and you have to have <laughs> the opportunity you have to have the the strength and the and the opportunity and the and the relationship to say i can't do that but i can do this right yes <laughs> so what's been your biggest learning as a business owner so i think i think what where we learn more than anything else is from our customer just trying to understand and truly listen to what their needs are you know sometimes uh, people have a tendency to listen to not to hear what they want to hear and not hear what they're actually being told <laughs> so that's always a uh, uh, that's been a good uh, opportunity for us to become better aware of the customer's needs and to create a better relationship with that particular customer and to not pull any punches and try and be in an open and honest about that. So, you know, the customer teaches us every day what makes sense and what doesn't make sense. And it's never the same for each customer. <laughs> you have to you have to do the due diligence. You have to invest the energy in the work. To, to try and get to that that point where everybody's on the same page and everybody feels comfortable with everybody. You mentioned it a couple of times, but the importance of of asking questions instead of assuming. And you know, the, there's the the fun phrase that we have two ears and one mouth, right? So we should, you know, listen twice as much as we talk. But you know, but in a sales position, it can be tough to right to not want to assume and not want to jump ahead, right? But to your point, right, slowing down and making sure that we're asking the questions and we're really understanding what the the customer's wants and needs are, and then tailor the right program or the offering to to what they're looking for as opposed to what we're assuming. It's it's huge in in any sales role to be able to make sure that we're we're getting that clarification up front. So. Well, and I think that there there you know there's a lot of pressure on a salesperson's side to sell something 
uh, you know, from my perspective, I'm always telling my customer, I don't want you to buy. I don't want you to, I don't want to sell you anything I want to buy. I want you to buy something. Yes. But if it, if we're not a fit, we're not a fit. And you're not going to hurt my feelings. I'm not here to hurt your feelings. I, I just want to make sure that everybody can move forward in the appropriate way and get the appropriate results without having to lie to people or yeah. tell people what they want to hear yes. or, yes. you know, and then, and then make yourself look worse because you can't meet the expectation. That you're <laughs> right. It's just a, it's, it's not a win-win. It's a lose-lose. Yeah. So uh, we, in our sales training, we teach the idea that you know, selling is professionally helping people to make a decision that's right for them. So it, right. Goes back Absolutely. to what you just said about you know not selling somebody but you know helping them to buy and and I like what you said that you know if if we're not the right fit we're not the right fit and that's okay right at least we helped to to determine that together and we can both move on. Yeah, we spent the appropriate time to determine if there was reason to move forward. Yeah, and sometimes there's no reason to move forward. It could be a pricing issue. It could be a design issue. It could be um, a philosophy issue. There's so many things that get in the way. So um, working with that particular customer and understanding and listening and um, meeting that need is is everything. Yeah. And they're going to respect you know us for that. And if we're not the right fit, they may know somebody that is. And That's they're going to remember how well we treated them. And maybe maybe later they come back and have somebody else they want to introduce us to. Right. No, absolutely. And and there's been situations where we have had a situation where, hey, maybe we jumped to conclusions. We maybe are, are maybe we didn't have a realistic expectation of how things should be or any number of things like that. But then there's always going to be that other customer who says, hey, he was right, but he's never going to know because I don't want him to know that he was right. So <laughs> sure. We, yeah. yeah. We, we get into the situation all the time where we tell customers, you know, we're here to educate you. We're here to make sure you're not making a mistake, but it's still your mistake to make. <laughs> sure. when you come back to me and say, hey, you should have never let me do that. The first thing I'm going to say is, yeah, absolutely. I should have never let you do that. I should have been better at trying to emphasize my point so that you wouldn't have made this decision. They don't want to hear that they made a mistake. Yeah. They want to know that you're on their side. So Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Hey, we know that down business success doesn't happen in isolation. So tell us about one of your biggest challenges during the years uh, running the business and and maybe a fellow business owner or a colleague that came alongside you and helped you through that. So um, our biggest issue has always been and always will be finding qual good quality help. Uh, that's not going to go away. Yeah. Um, the government's not necessarily helping us because um, the average American doesn't want to do what they say they want to do. Okay. Um, so uh, having somebody that else that we can turn to or having somebody else that will help us grow somebody, uh, somebody that cares as much about what, what's happening and where we're going and how can he differentiate himself from others that might be doing the same task are, 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 always going to be our problem. The last thing I want to do is put bodies in people's yards and, and um, that just doesn't, that's not helpful. It's not useful. We've been lucky to have an average uh, employee tenure of 13 years um, wow. right now. And um, I ha have employees who've been with me for over 25 years, so, uh, over 35 years, actually. So, so, you know, we've been good at respecting everybody's needs and wants um you know we're never going to lie to our employees just like we won't lie to our customers mm. um we're going to do what we can but i'm the first person to tell them hey i can't do that and if this doesn't work i get it i understand uh i think they appreciate the open openness and the honesty and and the willingness to be there for them otherwise they wouldn't be here as long as they've been yeah. Um, I don't know necessarily that I had anybody help me with that, you know, um, but um, it's, it's, you know, you watch, I, I don't know that anybody necessarily helped me, but you still watch uh, what other people do and what other companies do. And, and you don't want to try and reinvent the wheel, 
when somebody else has already solved that particular problem. So, yes. you know, being involved in the um, um, in National Landscape Association um, uh, helps us a lot because we can speak with other people who aren't necessarily in our market. You know, the people in our market uh, always have a tendency to say, well, I don't want to give you something that you might use against me, <laughs> and, which, is, which is absolutely unheard of. There's plenty of business out there for everybody. Why can't we all help each other? Why are you so afraid of your little bit of the market that, <laughs> yes. that I'm going to steal it from you because that's not what I'm after. What I'm after is to make the industry better. What I'm after is to is for everybody to win. Uh, I don't want your work. I want my work and I yeah. want it to be as best as possible. And you should want your work. And, yeah, you know, my ninety percent of the time, we're not even selling the same product. So right, yeah, it actually it brings up a the whole philosophy of scarcity versus abundance, right? So when we have a scarcity mindset, we're protective of and and end up, you know, just looking at the 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 opportunity as it's a fixed amount of opportunity, and we're just trying to steal from one another versus that abundance mentality. There is more than enough to go around, and if we right. get better, right, and 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 differentiate ourselves we'll have different target markets and we can right to continue to grow and develop our target market and our competitor can grow their target market and and that abundance mentality ends up attracting more opportunities right no absolutely and it's unfortunate that that people don't understand that more or it, maybe it's not taught well mm -hmm. but um it's critical in trying to take a community like Indianapolis or any place else and work together as a as a as a group to create a platform where everybody can can win as opposed to worrying about hey I don't want him to know this or I don't want him to know that <laughs> yeah because he's going to do something with it. Well, I'm it's gonna kind of uh, put you on the spot here a little bit. I'm gonna ask you to pick three people in your business owner journey that you're most grateful for them being there to help with your business's growth. So who are those three people and how they help you? So um, even though my brother's no longer involved in the business, he was very, uh, he was very helpful to me. Um, even though he was younger, he had a, a great handle on things. My father, of course, um, was, um, was, I can't, I can't express the words, um, but um, just, just the people I've learned, uh, I've met along the way who have, who have treated me with respect and, and, and um, realize that I'm not the enemy, you know, are, mm. are worth their weight in gold. I love that. Awesome. Well, let's shift gears a little bit here. Think about the next one to three years. What is your number one um, point of growth or development or challenge that you see uh, in achieving your goals? So I believe that our goals have been hindered over the last four, maybe 10 years because of, uh, of, of labor issues. Mm. Um, you know, um, I think that it's important that we always continue to grow in some way, shape, or form, whether that's in adding uh, other opportunities to make money or in just growing those individual opportunities. So um, it's a very competitive market, especially from the maintenance side, um, where customers aren't necessarily interested in what you bring to the table outside of the dollar amount, right. you know, where people would change might have had a relationship with a customer for 10 or 15 years and they'll change for $10 a month. Mm. You know, I mean, that's really not a relationship that you ever had or there are extenuating circumstances that get in the way. So for us, it's, it's still trying to continue to grow on a year to year basis as, as much as we can without overextending ourselves and creating issues that are going to come back to bite us because we couldn't meet a need or, or we weren't, or we lost our quality control or any number of other things that, that are going to get in the way. I don't see that going away until uh, the government allows us to uh, bring in um, Hispanic workforce or uh, outside workforces that are 
that are more than willing to come make a decent wage in this particular industry or in any number of other industries where they where the government in all their infinite wisdom says we these are these are jobs for Americans when Americans don't want these jobs. Mm. So you know you can talk about this all day long and it can be a Republican issue, it can be a Democratic issue. It's just an issue. Yeah. And it needs to be dealt with. And you have to put all the other crap aside so that you can look at things realistically. Otherwise, you're not going to have a plumber. You're not going to have this guy. You're not going to have a, a carpenter. You're not going to have anybody. And you're going to go, and all you're going to do is be paying and waiting more for more. You're going to be paying more money for the service that should cost less. And you're going to be waiting longer because the person that you want to do the work can only do so much work at any given time. Right. So it's a big problem. It's not going away. Uh, and all these people who have a better idea of things than I do, you know, are lost in their own little world. So <laughs> I'm well, sure there's a lot of people out there who would agree. Yeah, And, and I like that you, you made a, a specific point to say it's, it's, you know, it's politically agnostic, right? It's not one party or the other because both are, are having the same challenges. It's just, it is, it's just what, the industry is facing, right? That right. there are a lot of jobs that a, a lot of my clients are in the same boat where they're all looking for more employees and there just isn't enough people in the workforce that to, to satisfy those needs. So every, you know, lots of people are struggling. It's holding a lot of people back. And, and again, right. it's, it's not a, it's not one political view versus another. It just is a, a, a challenge and an issue that small business owners have. Right. And, 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 you know, like I say, it's, it's not going to go away. It's um, um, there's no, when, when compromise is no longer a term utilized in, in, in the process uh, and when the greater good is something that isn't, you're not looking down the road. You're just looking at how can I use this issue to create and to get something else that I want, then it's, you know, it's all, they're all, they're all hindrances, really. So, you know, you got to get past that. So last question here. Jim Rohn, uh, an awesome business guru, once said that we become the average of the five people that we spend the most time with. So as you think about that quote, what advice would you have for, you know, business owners who are trying to do it on their own, who who don't be part of, like you mentioned earlier, a, a, an industry group or, you know, aren't, aren't getting involved in a chamber or, you know, not reaching out to other people to ask for help and guidance? What, what would you say to them? So I think, uh, I think if you can get past this uh, idea of, well, I don't want to fail. And you look at the reality of moving forward and trying to have a successful business, then you grasp at whatever straw happens to be there. And you hope that that's a straw that holds. So whether that's a chamber group, whether that's the National Association of Landscape Professionals, whether it's any number of uh, regional or uh, local uh, professional organizations, you want to try and take advantage of those things so that you can extend your footprint, uh, become better aware of how people might have attacked a, a particular problem. And, you know, it may not happen in your own particular industry where you're not talking to that particular person. Sometimes you'll find the problems associated in most businesses are the same, regardless, <laughs> yes. you know, you're going to have this problem. You're going to have this problem. How can I retain my employees? How can I, how can I get better? How can I get more efficient? You know, you, you look at things and, and you, and, and you try and value what's important at that given moment. And then you move to the next thing. You know, if you're trying to fix 400 things, pick one or two yes. things, fix that. <laughs> Move forward, know you've got a list of things that you want to improve upon and focus on how I can get better in, in smaller increments um, so that you can continue to succeed and don't overextend yourself and don't make the same mistake that everybody else seems to make. It's It sounds simple, but it's not. <laughs> well, it, it's so true that the you know, the fundamentals or the best practices of running a business are the best practices, right? So you're right. Everybody tends to go through the same challenges and, and the same, you know, learning curves. And if we can ask other businesses that have, you know, maybe been 
been there already and get their tips and advice, that's, you know, that's always helpful. And what I found is that most business owners are more than happy to gift their time to a fellow business owner and, you know, and share some of the, the learnings they've had because they've been there, right? They get it. Right. And, they, and they, there's no reason, you know, there's no reason for somebody to grovel or go or crawl through the mud to try and get an answer to a question. You know, why not just help them? You know, why, you know, it's so easy just to say yes. Than, than it is just, <laughs> Gosh, I don't have the time or, you know, because there's always a hidden agenda there, you know, sure. you know the reason yeah. I don't have the time is because I don't want you to know what I know. Yes. Yes. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's crazy. Lowell, it sounds like you've been uh, blessed with some amazing people throughout your journey that have helped you with the business. If they were all here on the show today, what would you want to say to them? Thank you. I, uh, you know, I couldn't have gotten where I am without them. Uh, you know, I've had over 4,000 people go through, come through my door over the course of the 53 or 54 years that I've been in this business. And every one of them has brought something important to the table. So um, it's wow, been- Wow, what a number. Learning. That's amazing. Yeah, there's been an experience, okay, you know, uh, we used to be a lot, we used to be a lot larger back in the day, um, you know, where we might have, we, we would have had 200 people working for us. And, um, you know, my taste towards things changed. My brother's philosophy on things were different than mine. Um, um, we could have been even a lot larger back in the day, but it wasn't it wasn't a choice that my brother decided to make because he wanted to try and focus on a particular type of customer. When in reality, everybody's that type of customer. You just you just need to take advantage of those particular situations and and get rid of the ones that don't work and mm. add others that do. And <laughs> yes, uh, so so it's been it's been an interesting history associated with this particular with ProCare and I've enjoyed every minute of it and I uh, plan to enjoy every more minute that I have. So <laughs> fantastic. Well, well, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. Thank you so much for being on the show. No, thank you. I appreciate you uh, reaching out and having me on the show. Thanks for listening to the Self-Made is a Myth show with your host, Coach Tim Campsall. Please help spread this movement by liking and subscribing to our show and following us on Facebook and LinkedIn or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. To join our movement, go to BeMadTogether.com. Okay, folks, that's a wrap. Please pay it forward and be sure to tune in next time to the Self-Made is a Myth podcast.